Well, good evening, Northgate family and friends. Coming to you uh, from my office here at the church and um, excited about uh, digging into chapter three of the book of James today. Um, but before we start, I want us to pray. I want us to pray that God would uh, shed his light on his word in our hearts today and that uh, somehow his word will cause us to do what he says. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to look into your word. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is light and life. It's a light into our path, oh God, as your word says. And so, Father, we thank you right now that as we uh, study your word, read your word together, that it will change us. Lord, we know that just one word from you can change everything. And so, Lord, thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 3, it's a good one. You might want to put your seatbelts on. Uh, but we want to look at uh, the power and the danger of the tongue. We also want to look at the difference between heavenly wisdom, wisdom and earthly wisdom. James begins this chapter first uh, with, with a caution against, be, against becoming teachers. Uh, he says if you're going to be a, a teacher, you must have maturity and self-control. In other words, he's saying here in this chapter, learn how to control your tongue. Now, some of you are saying right now, well, I'm not a teacher, so I guess I don't have to learn how to control my tongue. No, that's, that's not what we're saying here. Uh, and he'll even give some illustrations uh, that we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, it, it, it appears that some who were in Jerusalem, they wanted to be teachers. And I think the reason was that they thought it made them look smart, wise, or maybe even important. And so obviously that was important to them that they looked important. Uh, if you remember last week, we talked about the teachings of Judaism that they were all struggling with. Uh, they, they, they still had their roots in Judaism. And, uh, and for them, last week we talked about it, it was in what they say as opposed to, to, to doing the right things. So they figured if they would just talk a lot, they could just, uh, they could say the right things, but they never had to back them up with doing the right things. They never had to back them up with real faith. So along with that, um, it brought attention to them. But James teaches that wisdom and understanding should be shown by the, by the conduct of our life. It also, it also involves humility. So let's take a look at verses 1 and 2, where he, uh, he cautions against becoming teachers. And that's, that's the very first point, if you're taking notes a caution against becoming teachers. Let's go ahead and read those two verses. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach, notice that he's including himself there, is that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. You can almost hear James say, if I were you, I would think twice about becoming a teacher. Some of you, that is your profession, and I, and I understand that. But why is this? So well, why, why is he giving this caution? Well, it's because there is a responsibility that's involved when you teach. See, a teacher uses words. We have people who listen to us. And we should care that our words reflect our character. James says that teachers are held to the highest standards. And no one, he says, is perfectly qualified. And he also says that we all make mistakes. 
It kind of reminds me when I was about 18 or 19 years old, uh, Ruth and I had just been married, and the pastor of the church, Pastor Jim Ritchie, came to me and asked me if I would consider teaching a fourth and fifth, fourth and fifth grade boys Sunday school class. And um, I said a couple things to him. I says, I don't think I'm qualified. And, and then I said to him, um, I'm afraid I'll make a mistake. And he says, well, first of all, you're not qualified. And second of all, you will make mistakes. We all do. Nobody's qualified. And so uh, that got me on a journey of, of teaching God's word. And I've been doing it actually ever since. And there is a responsibility. There, I don't think there's a time, well, there isn't. There's never a time that I don't get up on Sunday morning knowing I'm going to be sharing the Word of God and not feel nervous about that. And uh, even even sitting here facing a camera knowing that you're listening to me, it, it uh, at first, when I get started, yeah, it makes, it makes me nervous because I understand and I feel the weight of rightly dividing God's Word. And, uh, and this is why maturity and self-control it, it, it's a must so that we would learn how to do better with our words and not stumble over our words. Uh, my guess is that during that time in Jerusalem, that so many were trying to pass themselves off as teachers. And uh, many because they enjoyed the, the attention that it brought them. Um, that's not why I teach, I'll tell you right now. But it was also bringing a lot of confusion at that time, and there was a lot of uh, immaturity going on at that same time. So, uh, James now moves into the second area, and, uh, and number two, it's the power of the tongue. We, we're we're going to talk about the power of the tongue. So let's go over to verses three and four. He says, we can, uh, we can make a large horse go wherever we want to by the means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are still strong. Um, I just have to say that when it comes to, when it comes to controlling our tongue, um, it's because what we say has has weight to it has has our words uh, must be under control and uh, there's power in our words this is where James begins to give some illustrations about what he's talking about regarding the power of the tongue he begins with a by talking about a small bit that is placed in the, in the mouth of a horse. He also talks about a, a small rudder. Now both of those, for a ship, now both of those things relatively in comparison, they are small when it comes to what we're talking about. I'm told that the average size thoroughbred is about 1,100 pounds. And a small bit in the mouth of that, of that very powerful, powerful animal uh, allows the person who is who is working with that animal to be in control. And it's the same with the rudder on a ship. Uh, large, powerful vessels are controlled by a, by a rudder on a ship. And it says that it, it, it's controlled even in, in the strongest of winds. See, a word out of our mouth may seem like nothing, but it has the power to either bless or to destroy. We need to, we need to keep that in mind. Our words mean something. And uh, thirdly, there's the danger of the tongue. Let's read verses five and six. He says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark uh, can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. 
It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting our entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire, he says, by hell itself. I'm telling you, he, he, he's, he's nailing it here when he talks about how important it is that we control what we say. Uh, all of us have seen the effects of wildfire. We're from Southern California. I lived there most all of my life. Very accustomed to certain times of the year seeing wildfires take place. And we've seen it destroy homes. We've seen those things destroy hillsides. Entire communities are ravaged by wildfire. And usually they're started by a small spark. It could be a campfire. It could be a uh, power line that fell. It could be a backfire from a car. Uh, it, 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 could even, it could even be a bolt of lightning. But it starts very, very small. But the devastation that comes from that is just incredible. And that's what James is warning the people of Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem. Be careful uh, how, you, how you say your words, how you speak your words. Your words have value, they have weight. You need to be careful. James says that in the same way, the tongue can be a fire. It can be a fire. One word from our mouth can cause great devastation. See, our tongues are capable of defiling the whole body, it says. A, a, a wrong word can take harmony and turn it into chaos. Uh, it can destroy someone's reputation. Just, just one word. As long as I've been in the ministry, I have seen families torn apart by words. Children's lives go in all kinds of directions. Directions that God never, ever intended them to go. I remember when we lived in Palm Springs, uh, every once in a while on Thursday nights, we'd go down to the uh, street fair and, and down main, main center of town there. And there were street performers and there were painters and all, all kinds of things, people selling things. But hanging around all over that street fair were teenagers. And I, I came across so many what they call runaways or throwaways, 16, 17, 18 years old. And they lived on the street. Nobody wanted them. And in some of my conversations with some of them, it was an argument with dad, or it was, it was, it was a problem in the home somehow. And, uh, but it, it, it all centered around words that were being said, and their, and their lives were put in directions where now they had to run away. They didn't want to stay there anymore. They took off and they left, and they were now homeless. Words, they mean a lot. They matter. Number four. James now talks about taming the tongue. He says it's difficult. Taming the tongue is difficult. Verses 7 through 12, let's take a look at them. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it causes those who have been made, in the, and it curses, I should say, those who have been made in the image of God. And, all, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. God, the, the, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olive or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Man can control creatures, both land and sea. If, if you've ever been to a circus or you've ever been to SeaWorld, uh, you, can, you can see how some of these animals, big powerful animals, can be tamed and controlled. Um, you might say lions and tigers and bears, oh my, but they can be trained, but never the tongue, he says, never the tongue. 
The, the Bible calls it the tongue. He, call, he calls it restless, restless evil and full of poison. Now, not all the time, but there's times when the tongue becomes a detriment. It becomes poisonous. Now, here's the weird part. The weird part is with the tongue, we bless God. Isn't that true? We bless God, and then we curse man. The human being that God created, we curse one another. With the same mouth, with the same tongue, we bless God, and we curse one another. So, so, so there's both. There's blessing and cursing out of the same mouth. And James, frankly, just says, this can't go on. We can't keep doing that. He says, not even a spring of water sends forth fresh water and salt water. Figs don't produce olives, nor grapevines do, do they bear figs. So you ask yourself, well, what's the problem? Just, just what is the problem? Why can't I control my tongue? And some of you are probably thinking that right now. Why can't I control my tongue? Why do I struggle when I come to church on Sunday mornings and the worship team is up there and they're pouring their heart into this thing and there's some people around you, they got their hands lifted and their head tilted back and they're just praising God, but you're having a difficult time doing it. Why do I struggle when I, when I come to times of worship? Knowing that all week long, my tongue has not been something I've been proud of. Maybe you were on the job. Maybe you were with friends. Maybe you were just talking and you weren't thinking and your tongue just took off and did whatever it wanted to. Well, and I know that's how it seems sometimes. Maybe you have a problem with language, bad language. Maybe there's bitterness in your heart or, or, or maybe it's insecurities that you have that have caused you to slander somebody or talk bad about them. See, all of this that we're talking about has an origin. But listen to me, it's not your tongue. It's not your tongue. That's not where it comes from. It comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He said, A good man out of the treasures of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Then he, he, here's, the, here's the part of the scripture I really want you to get a hold of. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, you can blame your tongue all you want to, and I know we do. But that's not, that's not the origin. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, our mouth speaks. It starts here. When the heart is surrendered to God, the body and the tongue will follow. This doesn't happen overnight. If you're struggling right now, I, I, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. I want you, to, I want you to begin to surrender your heart to God a little bit more every single day. Surrender it to God. See, the, the, the way you talk to others will change. The way you treat other people will change. It all starts from the heart. When the heart is surrendered to God, it makes all the difference. We say it in OSL 1 all the time that uh, when we got saved, uh, it wasn't our body that got saved. It was, it was our soul. It was our spirit. And the rest of our body has to catch up with our soul, has to catch up with the spirit of God. So surrender your heart every day to God. And things will begin to change for you. Your talk will, will sound more like Jesus every day. 
Make a decision that somehow, as you, as you get closer to God and you, and you surrender to him, that God will change the way you speak. Number five, and lastly, James talks about heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. Verses 13 through 18. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by an honorable life. Wow. Doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is a selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. In other words, that stuff that keeps coming out of our mouth. For jealousy and selfishness are God's kind of wisdom. I'm sorry, are not God's kind of wisdom. I knew that didn't sound right. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace, loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. See, when it comes to heavenly wisdom, others will know you have it by the way you live. If you want wisdom that comes from God, others will know you have that kind of wisdom by the way you live your life. Not so much by what you say, but by the way you live your life. It kind of Reminds me of the old adage that more is caught than taught. You don't have to say a lot if your life is producing a character that people say there's something different about them. You don't even have to say a lot. Does your rep reputation, does it reflect someone who lives a humble life? Do you put others first? As Paul says, in honor and preferring one another. Is that who you are? See, when it comes to earthly wisdom, earthly wisdom is full of bitterness. It's full of envy. It's people who are self-seeking all the time. People who lie. People who twist the truth just to make themselves sound and look good. Whenever you try to look better than others or to get the better of someone, in the end, you know what happens? People end up getting hurt. People end up getting hurt with earthly wisdom. It happens all the time. It's not humble living. It's being selfish. In verses 17 and 18, James says that heavenly wisdom from above is pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's even willing to yield to someone else. Honor, preferring one another. With heavenly wisdom, there's, there's no partiality there. There's no hypocrisy there. This is wisdom that is flowing with mercy and blessing. This is mercy that is, this is wisdom, I should say, that is not two-faced. You're the, you're, you're, you're the same at home as you are at church. You're the same at work as you are at home. This is the kind of wisdom that develops a healthy community. Heavenly wisdom. This is the kind of wisdom that treats people with dignity and with honor. So to wrap it up, I challenge you to watch how you live. Watch how you live. As a believer, your entire life is a huge teaching moment. We started off by saying, James is saying, 
be careful that you don't aspire to become a teacher. But I, but I say that our life is a huge teaching moment as a believer. We need to tame our tongue. And we need to do that by guarding our heart. We need to choose heavenly wisdom over earthly wisdom. We need to bring life and peace to all of those people who observe you from every conceivable angle, angle of life every single day. Bring peace to them. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray today that your word has enlightened us today. Father, I thank you that it has the power to do that. Lord, I'm reminded that in Psalms 141, verse 3, it says to set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Lord, would you help us do that? Would you help set a guard over our mouth? And Lord, even before that, Proverbs 4.23, it says, Lord, to guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Oh God, we submit our heart to you daily. Lord, I give you my heart today. I ask you today that my heart would be pure. And that, the, and that out of the abundance of my heart, I will speak purity. I will speak of the love of God. I will, sp I will speak of the mercies of God. Out of the abundance of my heart, oh God, let, let me be gentle and caring. Out of the abundance of my heart, let me yield to others in honor and preferring them first, oh God. Out of the abundance of my heart. So, Father, thank you for my time with my dear friends in Northgate and friends that may be listening that aren't necessarily a part of Northgate, and we just welcome them, and we're glad that they're here also. Lord, thank you for our time together in your word. Your word is great, it's powerful, and we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder that uh, Sunday is... Uh, Easter Sunday, and we're planning just a great time uh, uh, for, for our service. We're at, we're at t again, once again, at 1030, and uh, on Facebook, uh, we'll be doing a, a lot of awesome worship, and uh, I believe the word that God has given me for Sunday will be timely, and uh, we're going to talk about the resurrected Christ, that he is indeed risen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great night, and we'll see you Sunday, or you'll see us Sunday. God bless you. There is no distance, I cannot be covered over and over, you're not defenseless, I'll be your shelter, I'll be your